Good evening. I want to thank you for joining me um, again this week on our Facebook Live um, Zoom town hall meetings. We, I, I think we're in week 10, week 10 of um, what's been asked of all of us is to shelter in place. For those of you who really um, have had the choice and have been able to stay at home, um, I want to say thank you. I know that this is really, really hard. Um, and I will just say that our efforts, they're working. We're, we're flattening that curve, which is what we've been trying to do. So that's the good news. The, the hard news is that we need to keep doing it. Um, and for those of you who really obliged to wearing face coverings, thank you so much. That really is about um, how our commitment to keeping each other safe. I know it's not comfortable um, and whether you're running or walking. So I wanna say again, thank you. And to those of you who've been personally impacted by the loss of a loved one or a friend, I wanna say I'm really sorry. This is a really hard time and, and I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of words that we've tried to grapple with to describe how, um, how unprecedented unprecedented this is, um, but I want to say um, together, really the, the only way out of this is that, uh, that we continue to support each other, trust each other, be patient, and listen to the scientists, and really honor and respect those on the front lines who don't have a choice to stay at home, whether they are at the hospitals or they are working at the grocery stores. Um, we will continue to support them by doing our part. So again, thank you, and I wanna welcome a really special guest I have here today. Um, somebody I've known for many years, and while we are so fortunate that he happens to be physically located right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he actually represents the life sciences and the biotechnology companies from around the state. Um, Bob Coughlin is a former state representative, and he's also been the CEO of the Mass Biotechnology Council, and the life sciences once again continue to lead the way um, and, and helping us understand what is our way out of here. And, and I think the here is not clear, but what we are looking to uh, do mm -hmm. is, is how do we stay safe? How do we fight this virus if we do get it? And what are their opportunities to actually develop a vaccine so that maybe none of us would get it in the future? Um, and so I'm, I'm so honored mm -hmm. to have you here, Bob, and I'm so grateful for the work of life sciences um, as a city councilor, I was really proud to support um, knowing, um, allowing these companies to grow in our city um, was important, not only in terms of what it brought to our city, but the importance of the life-saving research and the work that goes on there. And I don't know if people in Cambridge exactly know that they know that there's like these important companies that are really doing life-saving work in, in the life sciences. But if you could talk to us, Bob, a little bit more about what the Mass Biotechnology Council is and then um, before we get into sort of what companies are doing, um, I also know that you have a really powerful story that brought you to this work, if you care to share any of that as well. You've been an incredibly passionate leader for life sciences in Massachusetts. I, I, I fear to say one of their strongest champions early on and, and your belief in them, while it's not always visible to everybody because not everybody needs or sees the work of life sciences, right? It has personally touched you. And I think the eyes of the world are all looking to life sciences in a way that we never had to before. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Representative. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I want to start off by thanking you as well and all of your colleagues for the leadership that you've shown th through these very difficult times. Like you said, this is unprecedented. This is not something that came with a playbook, right? We are being so reactive. And I think yeah, it's a very difficult time. We will get through it. When we do get through this, I think we will all be better off from it. We will learn from it. You know, and, and to be here right in the heart of Kendall Square in Cambridge, you know, I want to thank all the residents of Cambridge. I want to thank them for sending you to Beacon Hill because you truly have been an amazing partner to work with. The way Massachusetts has become the best place in the world for the life sciences is because academia, industry, and government truly work together to solve problems. And, and there's nothing more difficult than trying to solve an unmet medical need. And we'll talk about that throughout our conversation this evening. Uh, the representative also alluded to the fact that, yeah, I'm a recovering politician. I've been out of government now for uh, 14 years, and I've been here at MassBio uh, for almost 14 years. And what got me to leave government 
And to come and work in the biopharma industry is a personal reason. Uh, you know, I learned a lot about drug discovery, not because I'm do a doctor, because I'm not. I'm not even a scientist. Um, I actually went to a Merchant Marine Academy to be an engineer to run the plants of ships, and I did time in the Navy Reserve. But what got me to, to this industry was when my wife and I were having our third child, uh, we found out that that unborn baby, because of prenatal screening, uh, was going to have cystic fibrosis. Now, let's go back, uh, you know, over 18 years, almost 19 years ago, to think that we are having a child, an unborn baby, that is going to be born with a disease, a rare orphan disease, of which there was no cure. And that really blew my mind. And it, it actually made me look at government a little bit differently because of my own personal experience. I wanted to know what government could do to try to create an environment so that scientists had the best chance of being successful so that they could invent a medicine that would keep my baby from dying. Okay, that's a pretty sobering thought. And it's not anything that I would wish on any parent ever. But the, the good news, and we'll fast forward through all of this, is that while spending time in government, I found that there were things that government could do that promote science, and there were things that government could do that would actually you know, hinder and stifle innovation. And I always wanted to be part of the team that would make Massachusetts better. Let's go back to what the biotech industry looked like 20 years ago. It wasn't where it is today, uh, but we were pretty good at it. You know, MassBio was actually founded in 1985 for two reasons. The first reason was to educate the Cambridge City Council as to what the definition of genetic engineering really was. Back in 1985, representative, they didn't even call it biotech. That was a new term. It was genetic engineering, and folks needed to educate the council as to this amazing science that was coming out of MIT, that it wasn't creating things with several heads and these monsters. It was really around working with monoclonal antibodies and, and creating a new way of treating diseases like cancer and rare orphan diseases and the like. So MassBio was formed. It was six companies locally here that founded it. Their stretch goal over 10 years was to have 20 member companies. And as I sit here today, we represent over 1,300 member companies in the life sciences industry. And as I sit here today, so that's that's a quick overview there. That's how I ended up at MassBio. Sounds like someone needs to mute there. Do you hear that, Representative? There we go. Okay. Yes, I think they just did. Okay, I think you just Perfect. froze on me, but here we go. Um, can you hear me, Bob? Okay, good. Well, I, I want to say thank you. I want to thank you for I can. Like, can your you hear me now? Passion, and I think um, that the story. Oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, this is our first Zoom yes. glitch on our town hall, but we're going to get through this. Okay, are we there? Are we back together? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone who can hear me, and thanks for your patience. Okay. So I think, Bob, I was just saying um, that your story, I think, is incredible. I think it's been an incredibly powerful story of what has driven you to do this work. And I think it's the story of, of many parents around the country, um, as well as those who are in the field doing research. Um, I also know that um, the council has played an incredible role very quickly at the beginning of what we were starting to recognize as this pandemic. And I'm, I'm not sure if I have you there because you're frozen on my screen. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about how quickly you were able to pivot and respond to this pandemic with, I believe we were calling it the supply hub. Early on, you know, all of our hospitals were um, quickly trying to find PPE. I didn't even know what PPE was when this first started. Um, I didn't know what PPE was. I didn't know what a command center was. I mean, these are all things that I think have become part of our vernacular. But very quickly, um, I think, you know, without anyone asking you, because this is who you are, and I think when you're in public service, you know, that nature for many of us is about we want to problem solve and we want to make things better for people who need, who need help. And quickly, you were able to coordinate amongst all of our life science companies and respond to um, a better way, a more efficient and coordinated way way of um, finding PPE that was readily available and connecting it to where it was needed. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what that process was like? 
Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at back historically, you know, we've been in this for about nine or 10 weeks now, but that virus was around, you know, probably in late January, early February, uh, it, it was around. And early March, real early in March, we were getting a lot of calls coming from hospitals. Um, not just the major hospitals, but also safety net hospitals like the amaz amazing uh, Cambridge Health Alliance, like you have right here in our, that we're fortunate enough to have right here in our backyard. They were realizing that they were going to really have this surge of, of patients. And the fear was because we live in a, in a time of just in time inventory as opposed to being prepared and having just in case inventory, they were, pe people were starting to panic. They were gonna say, we're not gonna have enough personal protective equipment, PPE, to really protect this huge amount of, of surge that's gonna come into our hospitals. How do we protect our frontline healthcare professionals with the, the gowns, the masks, I mean, people have learned more about N95 versus KN95 versus surgical masks than anyone ever would have uh, imagined. But a lot of these products are made in China. They're made in India. They're made in Singapore. The lion's share in China. Well, China was sick, you know, pr before we were facing all of this. So production was down. So because a lot of these materials aren't manufactured in the U.S. and we live in a time of instant shipment and satisf satisfaction. I mean, look at this Amazon world we live in, right? You can get whatever you need the next day. So we've really behaved in a way to save money and to not have large amounts of supplies sitting in warehouses. We, we, we live in this just-in-time inventory world. Didn't work. So due to the fact that so many different hospitals were calling up, sending emails and saying, hey, to any of your companies, to any of the life science companies, because we manage clean rooms, we have labs, we have a lot of PPE in our industry as well. These hospitals were saying, will your member companies sell it to us when we need it because we see a storm coming, okay? And when that happened, we were getting all these calls coming in. At the same time, government, whether this is before there was a command center, it was before Secretary Mary Lou Sutters was in charge of the command center, government was saying, my goodness, we need to start doing testing. We don't have testing for this particular virus. Keep in mind, folks, let's go back 10, 12 weeks. The only place in the country that was doing COVID-19 or coronavirus testing was the CDC. Big mistake. So now we had to figure out how do we get test kits here locally so that we can start testing people. Swabs, reagents, kits, things that we could send to the lab that would go in the machine and determine whether or not this person was infected with the virus or not. I mean, we weren't even set up for that. So I was getting phone calls from government as well saying, can you put us in touch with the CEO of this company, Thermo Fisher, or the CEO of Roche, or the CEO of Abbott that was working on a test? So I started to feel like a big phone book. And that's not what we wanted to be. So we thought that at MassBio, to add value to the situation and to give back, why don't we build out a portal? So we, we had an idea of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Emergency Supply Hub. And that would be a database in which we could take all of the needs that were coming from hospitals and put them in a database. On the other end, survey our, not just our 1,300 member companies, but we worked in partnership with MassMedic. They had about 500 member companies. So immediately close to 2,000 companies in Massachusetts, we were able to survey them to find out what they had for PPE in supply closets, here in Massachusetts. We didn't have time to order stuff from companies and have it not show up. We didn't have time to get stuff either on a shipping container on a ship or on a plane from China here. We didn't have time, folks. That's a very scary situation. Within 24 hours, we had the supply hub up and built. Within 24 hours, over 200 companies didn't off, they didn't only reach out and offer to sell their, their supplies, they donated them. To date, we've had over 500 companies in Massachusetts donate everything they had for masks, gloves, gowns, shields, pipettes, testing equipment, anything that we needed. And this, this supply hub 
was so successful. Some of my proudest moments over the last nine or 10 weeks was sharing the supply hub mechanics, database, idea, communications effort with states like Pennsylvania, California, Kansas, Washington State. We've really led the way around the country to help with that. The state, once we had that information available, MEMA and the government, because what we were able to get donated wasn't enough, but we also could help use our buying power of these large pharma companies to get materials here and then donate them. And, you know, not just the supply supplies, but also supply chain. And then we also got personnel. Who would have thought that the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and all these amazing men and women that work in the life sciences industry that had the credentials to work in healthcare say, hey, raise their hand and say, when fatigue sets in, when illness and disease sets in, let us know that we're your backup troops to come in and help fight this war. And when we flipped all of that over to the state portal, when the command center was built up, it was seamless. And to see the work that the men and women in the command center are doing, forget about partisan politics, ladies and gentlemen. Who cares who's a Republican? Who cares who's a Democrat? I'm a lifelong Democrat, but this Republican administration is working so hard to do the right thing. And I couldn't be more proud to be a part of it with them. Since the supply hub went over, I think we should probably talk a little bit more about diagnostic and testing and whatnot. But that's the response to you know what this industry has done to try to give back and help the real heroes of those frontline healthcare workers. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I think that um, I think people are very interested in hearing more about now what what is uh, vaccinations look like, what does the testing look like. But I want I think it's also important for people to understand. In those early weeks, um, I remember being on the hospital with our our you know Cambridge Health Alliance and the desperation of knowing we were we were not weeks, we were 24 hours away from being out of PPE, 24 hours away from being out of a mask, 24 hours away from being out of gowns, and and like calling people like you, calling companies that I knew. So you had a lot of people who on their own were frantically making calls saying, how do I get gowns to my hospital? How do I get masks to my hospital? And the story behind the scenes of how quickly uh, the Mass Biotechnology Council, you and your incredible team, because you've got some amazing people who work with you on staff, how amazing that that just quickly came together. And the day that I saw you um, up when we when we finally had the command staff up and going and Secretary Sutters was appointed, um, for me, that was a huge relief. For people who don't know, Secretary Sutters is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and you probably recognize her now because she's at every press conference with Governor Baker, and she was appointed as to be the point person for the command center. Um, she also happens to be a Cambridge resident, right? No coincidence there. Yeah. Um, we always love that Cambridge <laughs> connection. But I, I got to tell you, when I saw her appointed, I had a huge amount of relief because now we have a social worker at the helm of the command center um, who has dedicated her entire life to working to make sure that the most vulnerable people in our society are cared for. We know that this virus has quickly attacked those who are the most vulnerable in disproportionate ways. Um, quickly, you know, the beginning it hit a lot of people, but then when those who realized they could pull back from society had the choice to do that, then we knew that our more um, more vulnerable populations were going to be hit by this. And that's what happened um, across the state, but it really happened in Cambridge very quickly. Um, the Cambridge Health Alliance very quickly went into a medical surge um, because of the disproportionate number of people that were infected in Cambridge early on, and because we also, um, part of our community that we serve, our communities like Chelsea and Everett that were hit so hard um, mm. because you had so many workers who had no other choice but to go to work and who didn't have PPE and access to that. So I just think the behind the scenes stories for that has been really important. And um, I will always be grateful for the work that you did and watching you at that press conference the day where you did that warm handoff from the work that you had created to Secretary Sutter's for me was really one of those glimmering lights of okay mm -hmm. we've got smart people and we're going to get this done um i think that now moving forward here we are week 10 and i know that we're already seeing you know people in you know, the, the the term is quarantine fatigue people are feeling oh yeah and that's a that's a scary place to be because um i'm feeling it i, I think you're feeling it my kids are feeling it um you know everyone's feeling the idea that we're trapped in our homes and we're trying to figure out how do we open up and how do we open up safely? And how do we also do this in a way that's dictated by the science, <laughs> um, not by our own impatience? Because um, 10 weeks feels like a long time, but you know, in the scheme of life, 
it, it's, 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 first of all, it's not long enough for where we need to be to keep this um, suppressed. But can you talk to us a little bit about the companies that you are, um, that you know and that you're working with and the different kinds of ways in which they are leaning in? So there's the, um, there's the vaccine, the vaccines that people are really curious yep. about, right? But there's also, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other things that go into this. It's the actual, um, the mechanics of how you actually, um, d um, you know, my, my brain is a little fuzzy here, but the actual uh, machinery that goes into developing um, the vaccines and how to deliver this and the testing and the antibody testing. And I know that in Cambridge, we're fortunate that we are now offering universal testing for anybody in Cambridge who wants this, but I've had to explain to a number of people that is very different. Getting a test um, through the Cambridge Health Alliance only tells you if you have it today. It does not tell you if you have any antibodies. So maybe you could just give us an overall sure. the number of companies that are working on this. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to know the critical mass of companies. And when you couple that with the critical mass of amazing hospitals that we have, that's how we're going to lead through this. Because I, I say to people all the time, and, and I want to thank the Mass Health and Hospital Association and working with, you know, my former colleague and your former colleague, Steve Walsh, who heads up the Mass Hospital Association. We wouldn't have pulled off the supply hub if it weren't for MHA and the Council of Boston Teaching Hospitals working with Mass Bio and, you know, Mass Medic. It was really an example of teamwork that I've never seen in my entire life, never mind my career. I mean, it was truly amazing. And, and now when you look at what we're trying to do in the next phase as it relates to testing and vaccines, I break it up into three groups, okay? And keep in mind, in Massachusetts, we have 70 companies that are working on either one of these three things that I'm going to talk about. There isn't any other place in the country or the world that has 70 companies working on COVID-19 right now. The first piece is diagnostics, okay? Diagnostics is how you test. I said at the beginning that we didn't have testing that was adequate for this virus. So when you look at testing, there's two ways to test. You can test to see if someone had the virus, okay? And you can do that through a nasal swab, now a saliva swab, perhaps a blood prick, you know, we're working on the technology to get better at it because as opposed to sending the test out, finding out several days later, is there a way we can do it as a point of contact, contact, okay? Do it right there on site quick so people know real time what's going on. That's what we're working on from the viral testing standpoint. The second test is for an antibody. That test is to see if you have built up an antibody that fights this particular virus, and that would tell you that you already had it and it resolved. Maybe you had symptoms, maybe you didn't, but if you have a test that showed that you've built up those antibodies, chances are you're not going to get it again. I can't say that you won't, and scientists can't yet, because we haven't proven that. Um, they, I shouldn't say we. They haven't proven that. But chances are if you had the antibodies you probably won't get it again. So that's important information to have. When the governor's office talks about taste testing, whether it's for surveillance, that's to see if hot, hot spots are gonna pop up in the, in the future. They also wanna do what they call contact tracing, and that's via the phone. If somebody had it, we wanna know who they've touched and try to control the spread through c communication, okay? So that's the t diagnostic piece. The therapeutic piece, is therapies. If you get the virus, is there a medicine that you can take that slows down the progression of the virus and treats the symptoms so they don't get worse? I use an, a, a, an example, the flu, right? We all know about the flu. When you get the flu, you can get a prescription and take Tamiflu. And that will keep, if, if you do that early, when you immediately get a fever and feel a little achy and pain, you take Tamiflu, that flu isn't gonna run its course and go through and create the pro all those problems and pain that you normally would get if you didn't take Tamiflu. That's known as an antiviral or a therapy. That's a medicine that you take when you get the virus. You've heard a lot about remdesivir, a Gilead drug. It's been approved. There's been some success with that. There's many, many, many drugs in trials right now that are trying to get approved to be a therapy. When there's a therapy, that doesn't keep anyone from getting it, but it will make 
a lot of people feel more safe to get back out there and get back to that new norm, right? But, you know, my son was CF. We don't want him to get the flu during normal time, but we always knew that if he did get it, we could give him Tamiflu and we weren't distraught that he was going to die, right? We can't feel that way right now with COVID-19 and we're petrified that he could get this and it, it, CF is a respiratory disease and this is a respiratory virus. We don't want it. So we want those therapies to be approved. The third bucket is a vaccine. A vaccine is what we give to people so that you build up that immunity to COVID-19 and you don't get it, okay? There's different ways to do vaccines. The traditional way, you may have read about it, that vaccines are actually a mild form of that virus that gets introduced into your body in a mild way, so you build up your own antibodies. That uses, like, you can deliver it using eggs in different ways to introduce it to your body. That's the traditional way. It's very time, takes a lot of time to invent it. You have, it's clin clinical trials in vaccine development that way, very long, because you're not gonna expose people to a virus intentionally. You have to just give them the vaccine and go on your merry way. And it takes a long time to do the clinical trial aspects to check for efficacy. The other piece is using what you've heard about Moderna, a local Quincy company. They're using RNA interference, right? They're using a new way of introducing that virus into your body and tripping it up so that you're not gonna get COVID-19. If you do get it, it trips it up that way. And again, I'm not using scientific terms. If any of you folks are scientists, I apologize. This is how I try to explain those three different things so folks that aren't scientists understand what we're working on. Now, the vaccine combined with people building up antibodies and introducing vaccines into our society, that's the only way that you can build up that community immunity so that we can get our arms around this and get back to our normal way of life. Traditionally, vaccines take a long time to invent. What we are seeing right now, because every, right now there are, uh, I said over 70 companies in Massachusetts, there's over 100 companies that are in clinical trials for vaccines right now. Two of them are from Massachusetts. We have one company that's actually manufacturing vaccine right now when it's only in phase one clinical trials, because they're that confident that this may work. They're sharing information. Companies hope, I've never seen so many companies, large, medium, and small, working together to conquer a problem. I wish they were all doing this for cystic fibrosis 18 years ago, but it ta it's taking something of this proportion. When did we ever think that a vaccine would be the most important thing to the world's economy. The world's economy. Well, it is right now. And to see these companies not worry about who's getting credit, they all hope somebody else wins and gets it first. Anyone who says that this is all about money is ludicrous, okay? Vaccine industry isn't a big money industry. It isn't, okay? It's something that needs to happen and everybody is working so hard. I have a front row seat to it. I'm grateful for that. And I've never seen companies share ideas so much. I go back to the hospitals. We have the ability, because we're home to five of the top six NIH-funded hospitals right here in Massachusetts. You can walk to them all from Cambridge. The ability that we have to deploy clinical trials and all work together and perhaps put these multiple companies on one platform to accelerate clinical trials, to see that one of the companies said they might have this done in four months. That is a, this isn't a, this isn't a race to find a therapy. Or, or vaccine, this is a sprint. And the only way we're gonna get through this, and we will get through it, is science is gonna lead us through it. And we are the best place in the world for science, right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we have so much to be proud of. Hey, Bob, thank you. I, again, you know, whenever I need a little pick me up around this, because I every day, like you, I'm, I'm working it, I'm talking to the constituents who need help, or I'm talking, quite frankly, to a lot of smaller hospitals, providers, because I chair the Committee on Mental Health and Substance Use, and my job is to really make sure that we also ensure that our behavioral health systems don't fall apart, because now more than ever do we need them. So I also, um, I have the opportunity, I, I call you or I call our friend Steve Walsh, who, who was 
almost going to be here from the Mass Hospital Association, but we don't want to take him away from the really important work he's doing um, this evening as well. And I told because the because the insight of you of, that you have of, of who's doing what and the enthusiasm and the, the view that you have, I can recall as a city councilor being frustrated that a lot of these biotech companies that are in Cambridge wouldn't share the same buses, right? So just at a very small level going, you know, why do we have to have, why does every company have to have their own transportation system? And this was really about intellectual propriety of information and to know like, you know, compare that to mm -hmm. companies around the world and scientists around the world who are working together really closely. And to know that a lot of that is happening right here in Cambridge um, and in Massachusetts, for me is really, it's inspiring and it's exciting. So when I need a little pick me up, I call you, I call Steve, and then I get a perspective that just actually keeps me grounded and like, <laughs> we're okay. It, you know, this is hard, it's painful, it's really sad. Um, to not underestimate how, how awful this is because people are dying and we both know people who've lost loved ones to this. Um, but to know that this is not our forever. It's a new, it, it's gonna be a new normal, but there was a new normal after the Spanish flu and people, and, and we didn't know that better of it, right? So there's gonna be a new normal. One of the questions that was um, emailed into us was, will face um, coverings, so I wanna say, I'm gonna just close. The question that's being asked right now was by one of the most inspirational women in my life. She was a um, baseball um, umpire when I played Little League. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first girls to play Little League in Cambridge when it was all boys. And I, I, you know, I'm going off here a little nice. bit about that. My father was like, no, girls don't play. And my mom was like, of course <laughs> she's playing. Neither one of my parents ever well, used to bet. game. But I was not a great player, but whenever I would hit that ball, that umpire, Valerie Bonds, I know you're watching, um, she would, take off her mask and, and start cheering and hugging me and then go back and, and umpire the game. So um, Ms. Bonds, I want to say thank you. Um, not only was she was an umpire, she was also a coach at the high school as well as a, um, a security guard. So I'm, I'm so glad you're watching. And the question that she has is, will face coverings become a daily part of our life for quite some time? And I think the answer is yes. Um, until, until we actually find a way to um, flatten the curve, slow the spread and have a vaccine, um, and, and Bob, you tell me more what you know about that, but that, you know, my understanding is that they will be a part of our life for some time, um, not forever, but for some time. Yeah, I, I definitely, it's not going to be forever. I mean, ultimately, once we get a vaccine and we build up that immunity through antibodies combination vaccine, we, we will get back to normal. I think what we, the way I look at it, and, and thank you for the question, the way I look at it is that I think we're just going to be a lot better at a lot of things. Guys, let's not lose sight of the fact that the flu has been catastrophic every year. I think in my family, because of the fact that we have a child that can't get the flu or this, we don't want that to happen. When my son has been on airplanes, he's always had to wear an N95 mask. We've always, I had Purell dispensers in my house. I have for 18 years. It's funny, and I, it isn't funny, but I hope you will allow me to at least share with you that my house we joke a little bit because we were COVID-19 ready already and, and my son even says that he, he feels like his own friends have a better sense of empathy as to what he's been going through during flu season. They'd be like, Bobby, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? He's been out of school during flu season in the past. I think that this social distancing, sanitizing our hands, face coverings for the time being, I think we're going to be better at transmitting virus moving forward, whatever the virus may be. As far as COVID-19, there's just so many unknowns. This is so insidious. I've talked to some of the smartest scientists in the world that just really didn't know why this spread the way it did. And there were so many unknowns about droplets and in and, and contact and how long does it stay alive on, on, on surfaces. There's so many unknowns there that we really, like I've had, some of my friends have been like, don't you think people are overreacting? I don't think people are overreacting. I don't think that it's a bad idea to wear face coverings. I mean, I got my own little designer face covering here. I've got sur a surgical mask in my own clock one. When, when I'm not sitting at my seat and I'm in an office alone, the minute I move around, I'm wearing it. Just walking from here to the parking lot. Even if I'm not coming within six, six feet of another human being, I, I still wear it. Cause I just think it's, it's not just about me 
what if I were infected? I don't want to spread that to any other surface so somebody unknowing citizen would come by and touch that doorknob after me or whatever, right? Um, so to I know that was kind of a long babble, but I think you're going to see face coverings in our future for a while. Um, and I think you're going to see that a lot of people, even if it isn't mandatory, will continue to do so. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, Bob. Um, and and in response, thank you for the question. I do think that again, right now, you know, the public health protocol is to wear a face covering. And I think what the difficulty is, I, I've talked to people who I know very well who resent being told that they have to wear a face covering. Um, and I, I just will ask, and I've, I've seen people around our city who still aren't wearing them, or you know, runners who are going by, and and I've tried to go out running with a face covering, and I know it's hard. Um, but it's something that we need to do. And I remind people that when you're not wearing a face covering, what you're doing is you're not protecting someone else. When I wear my face covering, that's about me trying to protect you. That's right. And this thing about sort of trust and, and when it right. comes to face covering and distance, um, I, I've seen I've seen in my neighborhood people are, are are gathering with friends right now, and um, and it's challenging because I, I you know what I keep saying to people is we all want to be gathering with friends. I want to be gathering with friends. I want to gather with my family. But this idea of who we can trust, it's just as elusive as the idea of memory. That's the best kind of analogy that I can come to. Like that we think we can trust somebody. What we don't understand is that you know as people move through space, that they don't all we're not always aware of what we touch. And we also know there have been people who've, who've taken every precaution and still have caught it without knowing that, right? So this idea that, you know, does life change? It does change. And I will continue asking people to, you know, remind people that six feet distance right now, that's the minimum. If you actually talk to the epidemiologist, they will mm -hmm. tell you, I've heard six feet to 12 feet to 15 feet. So six feet is the actual minimum. So if you assume the person who you're talking to has COVID, just assume that they do and let them assume that you have it. Um, if you assume that they have it, you're going to think differently about what the minimum of that distance is for now and about coverings, both for them and for yourself. Um, Bob, tell me what else that you are seeing on the horizon, because we're talking about um, development of the diagnostics, right? So it's one thing to have the vaccine, but it's also to be able to diagnose the testing. There's still a lot of questions out there about how accurate is the testing both for the virus, how accurate is it for antibodies? I know that a lot of people are interested in this antibody testing, and um, I, I'm kind of up in the air about whether or not I want one because I've also read right now, we just don't know how accurate they are. We know that yeah, that's there's correct. some level of accuracy and then there's also a number of faults. And so um, nobody should get a false sense that they're safe right now, especially since we don't even know whether or not the antibodies provide short-term or long-term actually immunization. But can you tell us more about the companies in Massachusetts that are working on um, what, diagno what, what diagnostics are they working on? Um, and we, so we've talked a little bit about the therapies. So we know companies um, like, um, uh, what's, the name, um, what's the name of the company that's doing the um, Versetta there? We just said Moderna. Gilead. So we know companies like Gilead. Are oh, that's, Gil Gilead. that's Gilead. And, and Moderna, and we know is working on that as well. So Gilead's working on therapies. Moderna's working on vaccines. A lot of other companies working on this. Um, and then we also know that um, the diagnostic part of this, the actual um, machines that we need to actually use for this. So at one point, so very early on, again, I'll just put a really a special plug in for the Cambridge Health Alliance. They did not wait to actually try to contract out with companies that were CDC approved. You know, the state, the state did hesitate. The state was trying to play by those rules and wait for the CDC. Um, our hospital, our safety net hospital, um, Dr. Syed, he just said, I'm not waiting. And he actually early on contracted out with a company that was not CDC approved yet. They are now. Uh, and that's how Cambridge was able to be the first hospital ready to up and go with um, drive through testing. We couldn't do all that testing because we didn't have all the swabs that we needed. And so I know that you that's mentioned right. there are some, some, we got swab testing. Now they're starting to do some saliva testing. But if you can tell us more about, you know, we only have a little bit of time left, but what where are the life science companies today on, on all of this, in addition to the, the therapies, the actual diagnostics, and, and what should we be, like, who are we rooting for right now in Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah. okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but at MassBio, we're working on a program that's called Reset, and we're sharing this with everybody, and we're working very closely with the state. Because we're the life sciences industry and we were essential, we have remained working, anyone who's doing COVID-19 research, as well as the R&D component of all these folks that have been working for decades on certain diseases and whatnot, we couldn't let that science stop. So a limited amount of our employees who are in R&D have been going to work. Anyone who can work from home has been working from home. And no matter what the governor talks about as it relates to next week and following week, we, as an industry, we're gonna promote having people who can work from home continue to work from home until there's a vaccine, okay? So that's, as an industry, we've decided that. That being said, our program called Reset is restarting our economy safely through employee training and testing, okay? The training pieces are back to work best principles. If you want, anyone wants to visit that or see what that looks like, go to massbio.org, click on our COVID-19 resource page. There's a plethora of information there. And we even have the back to work principles, safe, principle, uh, safe back to work uh, actions necessary for essential life science employees. We're sharing it with everybody. The, the, the second phase is testing. How are we going to test our employees so that we know that people are safe coming in and out of our labs and our manufacturing facilities, et cetera? Representative, you were correct. I do not think that today there is a gold standard test for antibodies that I would trust. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. That's just my opinion. But we are close. I mean, there's a company, a Massachusetts company that I, I can't use their name right now because I don't have permission to do that. That's probably about three or four weeks away from getting EU approved, EUA approval for having a diagnostic kit that works. Ultimately, you'd want a test with the same accuracy and ease of use as perhaps a pregnancy test, right? That's how we could be able to surveil ourselves regularly, easily, cost-effectively. If you do this testing and then it gets sent off to a lab and you get the results back five days later, what good does that do if by chance you've had the virus, right? And, and it's a virus test. So we've written up all of these plans. I have about four or five amazing plans white papers that could be utilized, but the science of the diagnostics hasn't caught up yet. When you look at the amount of companies that are working on that, you've heard a lot about Abbott. Abbott has an amazing quick virus test. It's not the antibody test, it's the virus test. And they can do it quickly, but they can only make so many at a time. They're ramping up manufacturing. Everybody wants them. Everybody would buy them, right? They need it, but you can only keep up with so many. So until, when you look at, what we've done in the last nine weeks as it relates to testing and diagnostics and capabilities and ease of use and improving accuracy. And it's amazing to see how far we've come. And again, I think we're literally only weeks, if not a month or so away from having the testing science. Then, it, then you're gonna ramp up manufacturing, deployment, et cetera. But you know, again, you look at what the Broad is able to do. You look at what all these organizations are able to do. Companies can do this sort of testing in their own facilities. And we're working closely with government to get the approval to do that. We never, ever, ever wanted to start taking testing capacity and bandwidth away from the patients that we're trying to keep alive. That was very important to us. So any resources we had were donated to the hospitals, even if it's from testing. We work with the state. This isn't something that companies are gonna go rogue and wanna do their own thing. Anything that we do now, we're sharing regularly with the state, but we're, we're a few months, we're a, several weeks to a couple of months away from getting there. Thank you. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the Broad. We are so lucky. Um, I, I, you know, I think the world is lucky, but to know that the Broad Institute here is in Cambridge, to know Eric Landers, who is a Cambridge resident, but really is, you know, the world actually is, is really looking to Eric and his team. But because of the Broad Institute, we've been able to do more testing in Cambridge as well, who's actually helped process, um, probably not just testing in Cambridge, but they have helped us. So we've been able to really continue to target um, all of our um, we did all of our nursing homes, um, all of our congregate care homes. We've just expanded to be able to target um, neighborhoods that have a higher population of individuals who have been diagnosed 
um, with uh, COVID-19, both um, starting in the, what's the Port neighborhood, which is literally you are right there in the middle of what, once people would have said you were in the middle of, of um, that your office was in the middle of the Port neighborhood, some people refer to your office as Kendall Square. I will say the Port neighborhood. I'll just give you a little bit of local geography there. Um, and just to say, you know, thank I you to what it. they've been doing. Um, I love I, it. I think the thing to just uh, keep in mind here, right? So we know, we know it's it's going to be, it's going to be testing, it's going to be contract um, contract tracing, and it's going to be PPE. Those are the three things that are going to be key. Um, and then being able to the, the ability to do all of those. Um, I won't get into it now, but I will share with people through my, my email list and maybe another town hall. Um, Massachusetts is also looking and supporting ways to increase manufacturing um, right here in our state. And it's, I'm seeing some really exciting possibilities there. There are a number of companies that have already pivoted and they are actually helping to manufacture and create some of those things that we just talked about. I think we're gonna see more companies in Massachusetts doing that with the support of state government. Um, and just to continue to remind people that um, that while the sprint for the vaccine and for the therapies is happening, the rest of us, we're, we're involved in a marathon, right? And I, I was saying that I think it's not just a marathon, it's an ultra marathon, it's a couple of marathons. And so the more that we can be patient with each other, the more we, we can rely on the science and um, the work that's being led by many of the um, amazing people at, um, in the life sciences. And then I will finally say to just to um, people in Cambridge and who are watching this, again, thank you for your patience and thanks for your commitment to this. Um, believing in science matters. We, we see that, right? If we had a president who believed in science, we might be in a different place right now. Um, but, but certainly Massachusetts believes in science and we support our life sciences. And um, as long as we continue to recognize that um, we, we don't self-exempt ourselves from the, self, from the public health protocols, Public health protocols are meant to be universal, not, um, not self-exempt. So that includes for social distancing and, and for covering of the mask. We will get there. Um, and for those who are watching, if you have any questions about anything we've talked about today, please feel free to email me. Um, if you have any questions or needs that you're still struggling with, my office is always available. So please reach out, call us, email us. We're trying to call seniors throughout uh, the city to make sure that we're meeting your needs. And to say um, to all of our frontline workers from, um, and I, I include those, everybody who's working in a hospital and a medical facility, congregate care, um, nursing homes, to, our, to those who are working in the grocery stores who are packing and delivering. Like, we thank you and we are grateful for the work that you are doing. Um, and Bob, to the scientists and the researchers who are working with you, um, you know, our, our commitment, and I think our, you, you talked about coming out of this stronger. I think one of the things that I recognize for, for those of us like you, like myself and others who really believe that government's role is in, is in supporting the most vulnerable amongst us, I think what's really being shown to us is that if believing that, you know, the basic need to housing and, and health care and food, if we don't see that as a human right, we're left with seeing that as a public health, you know, response now. Because if we don't respond to people's basic needs, and, and it's um, from a, a, a perspective of human rights, then we must respond today as a public health response. Because if we don't meet everyone's needs and allow them to stay safe, um, get well, still feed their families and have housing, um, then we're all at greater risk of this not slowing down. And is there anything else that you would like to say to the people of Cambridge about the life sciences? Anything that you think that you want to make sure we really understand the work that you're doing or, or who you are over there? No, I just want to thank the people of Cambridge for, you know, being our neighbor to this industry. When I meet with my colleagues from not just all over the United States of America, but all over the world, the port, right, here in Cambridge is, is, the envy of the world and it's an honor for us to be here and I am so grateful and fortunate to be able to work here in this wonderful city and I want to thank your elected officials and especially you representative Decker for the work that you put into this um, is is around the clock and I'm grateful for you I'm grateful for you being an elected official and in and, and really spending the time and being so compassionate and conscientious because this is about everybody. This is the first time in my life that everybody is relying on help to get through this. No one person or one company can get through this. This is, this is, 
catastrophic in a sense, but at the same time, I've never been more optimistic. And, and, and Representative, you and I have been talking regularly now for over nine weeks about this issue. I wasn't as optimistic nine weeks ago, eight weeks ago, seven weeks ago, six weeks ago. What I have seen happen in the past few weeks in this industry because of collaboration and communication and sharing and, and, and working together, we're going to be so much better at solving unmet medical need that moving forward after this, if we can take some of these same principles and ideas and behaviors and do it for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and ALS, in Alzheimer's, think of how much better we can make the world and how much cost we can remove from the healthcare system if we eradicate these other diseases the same way we're going to eradicate and kick the dickens out of COVID-19. I know we're going to win. I'm pumped up because of what I get to see and hear every day, and I'm more optimistic than ever. And I hope all of you, the, the, I wish all of you the best, and I hope you hang in there, and I hope you are well, and I hope you know that if you reach out to anybody, uh, like when, when Representative Decker says call her office i know i've called a couple times when i've needed help over the last few weeks and her and her amazing staff are there 24 7 to help and i'm i know they'll be there to help you with whatever you whatever your needs are so thank you madam chairman it, it, it means the world to to have you as a friend and i and thank you for having me on tonight Thank you, Bob. I wish you and your family, you know, wellness. And Thank I know you. that your guy there had a had a, a happy birthday not too long ago. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. And to CCTV, I want to say thank you as always. Special shout out to Susan and Sean. Thank you for just yeah, working so hard right now. They have you guys have not missed a beat in making sure that um, our community is staying connected and staying informed. And to my incredible staff as well, who are behind the scenes making this all possible, I want to say thank you. Um, and until until next week, be safe and be well.